use. Um, Norbert, you want to touch on security? Is that something that concerns you at Trust, um, and how do you approach it? I believe that uh, there are different kinds of security. There is digital security and about the hacks, and there is uh, security of uh, keeping your private key. And I believe that mass adoption of uh, digital centralized currencies will bring the security of uh, the awareness of how to uh, keep your private keys and don't lose them and don't forget them, make copies of it, uh, print them out and so on and so on. It's like with uh, keeping a pin to your uh, bank account right now. We didn't know how to, use, how to use them until banks started to use it on the global scale, scale. It will be the same with uh, centralized digital currencies. If states will uh, implement digital currencies, uh, they will be, they will assure people that it's secure and they will educate people how to use their private keys. Yeah, we're going back to education. And another interesting point is, while it's true that the, there is an added complexity to this technology, sometimes, bizarrely, um, it can lead to new features. I'm thinking in particular in the sharing economy. I was working on a project called Slocket until recently. And what you mentioned about this, um, you know, you have to make a copy of your keys and so on. This key in question could open, say, your door, right? The idea was to do a decentralized Airbnb. So the cool thing about it is if you think about multi-sig, multi-signature accounts where you need multiple signatures in order to, say, open said account, you could also apply it to a door. So if you had, say, lost your key, you could take, say, three of your neighbor and rebuild the key. That was kind of a cool feature. So sometimes, in a sort of counterintuitive way, this technology leads to innovative approaches. Um, which actually leads me to the next and final question, decentralization, you touched on it, Vitaly. Um, this, this question of decentralized versus centralized, you know, I think a lot of people find it very confusing. When you say decentralization to me, what I'm hearing is what Vitaly said, which was there are no killer apps on, say, Ethereum, there's only killer infrastructures, meaning you take what is centralized and monopoly in nature, say for example, a sharing economy, Uber, things like that, and you give it to the people. You Essentially, you're building co-ops, more or less. The problem is when you do that, and if you're Uber, you certainly don't want to build that because you'll kill yourself. And that's true for insurance and so on. So how do people in the audience address the question of blockchain, adopt blockchain, but don't necessarily end up in a situation where they're destroying their own business, if you will? Now, anyone wants to touch on that? It's a big question. <laughs> so, I guess, yes, I, guess, yeah. I guess when we touch on um, centralized versus decentralized, it boils down to a number of things. Um, and interestingly enough, it boils down to fundamentally the actors who create said platform. Because if you have something which is truly decentralized in nature, then the people who create that don't really benefit. So everything that's created has some level of centralization. Um, like whether that's you know, even in the case of Ethereum, where a small number of the kind of like token allocation was held back by the foundation for future developments. The only truly decentralized thing which was ever created was the DAO. Um, and if that was to go forward, then there was no guarantee that the team itself who created the DAO would have even had any funding from it. It was saying that we're giving this to the world and let's see what happens. Um, it boils down, it, it boils down to, to use case, what makes sense and what doesn't. Like, and, and ultimately, uh, <sighs> The interesting thing is that where are we removing power from? Because ultimately, the idea with decentralization is you take power from a centralized mass and you distribute it, correct? So what, what, what do you want to do that with? I mean, we're, we're working internally at Atlas Oil on a project called Deodans, and there's a lot of information about this on the internet. But the idea is that instead of investing in charities, you could directly take you take kind of your assets and invest them straight to the natural resource or the tribes or the things that you care about investing. You essentially give autonomy to natural resources. They can issue smart contracts and they can look after themselves. And hypothetically, like that's decentralized and decentralized in a better way of saying, well, hey, you know, you can remove intermediaries. You can, you know, do all of these exciting things through that. But well, how do you make your money? Well, that's it. It doesn't make money. So fundamentally, you have to turn around. And if you're doing something which is entirely decentralized, you have to either be I mean, the sad part is you either have to already be incredibly well off or you have to be so altruistic that you have no problem in doing so. Because we work, if, you're, if you're willing to start a business and there's some level of you which wants some kind of payoff from that, whether that's to look after your family or to turn around and you know, have a name for yourself, but if you can't put bread on the table, then there's an issue. So the people who could potentially do mass decentralization are the people like Vitalik or other people in the space that have done well enough that they don't have to turn around and play by the same rules that everyone else has to play by. That's good news. I mean, I've heard when we were in the, uh, the back room, um, did one of you mention decentralized exchanges? I think either one of you too, right? Um, I think same question for you guys. We hear decentralized exchange. Are you decentralized? In what way? 
And if you are decentralized, how do you make money? That's the big question, I suppose. I mean, we're, we're, we're a centralized exchange, um, and I would always remain a proponent of centralized exchanges. Um, but, you know, especially, I think, uh, an interesting topic point to, to, to focus on is let's look at, you know, what's recently happened with the, uh, the number of major exchanges which have been subpoenaed uh, in, in the U.S., well, by U.S. authorities. That wouldn't have happened if they're decentralized, because what are you subpoenaing? You're just, you know, you're chasing a decentralized body. Good luck with that. Um, the, the fact that, you know, when you, when you have a centralized exchange, there is that kind of one head to hit, uh, that one data source, which obviously creates an interesting dichotomy in that, you know, it, it's on one side, you can view it as this is negative, this is bad, because it gives you that, that one target on your back. But it's also good because if you're trying to act as a correct actor, uh, you have that data, you have that ability to say, yep, these are all the transactions, these are all the people, and, and there's, there's nothing really wrong with that. So I think part of it does come down to a bit of, um, dare I say, you know, are, are you a, a purist and a, a libertarian, and it comes down to a slightly uh, a socialist aspect of, on, on that side, or kind of where, where your head's at and, and how you really believe it, rather than a purely business case. And you show decentralized approach for the reason you highlighted. How about you, Vitaly? How does it work? We, at are, we are obviously also a centralized exchange, and mm -hmm. uh, like, uh, apart from, from, from obvious drawbacks of decentralized exchanges like UX, lack of liquidity, and, and stuff like that, uh, I don't actually see much cases why would you need a decentralized exchange, to be honest. Because, like, yeah, it's anonymous. Why would you want to be anonymous there? Like, uh, it has no control, it's unregulated. It actually attracts more bad actors to, to that kind of thing, rather than, than the centralized exchange you actually trust, which reports to, to your government, which is fine to me, I think. Fair news, and, and obviously, Paolo at Genesis, um, mining is all about decentralization, like you highlighted earlier. And I think Vitaly mentioned GHash, and I remember those days because we were looking at the graph and we were waiting for it to just tip over 51% and the crypto yeah. apocalypse, which thankfully didn't happen. <laughs> um, what do you think of that sort of dichotomy between those two worlds? Uh, in this case, uh, nowadays there are more companies, so it's more difficult to, to this happen, this 51% as the GHash that you mentioned. Uh, I personally prefer decentralized, decentralized everything. For me, it makes the, the economic growth. More people, more jobs, more money. We are here because of the decentralized economy. And uh, so everyone should consider that. What is the best uh, for your business? Is a decentralized model? Uh, one example of that is the ABM and Mask, uh, this huge Danish company for, for shipment. They make an experiment. And uh, it, they send one container from Kenya to Rotterdam, Netherlands. And uh, this one container, it was uh, passed by 30 organizations and more than uh, 200 communications, it was necessary. And if one of these communications, like a lost farm happened, it could uh, uh, make delays in the shipment. So one blockchain, in this case, on there is many participants, it's very interesting. So you are decentralizing the process. This is the point. And uh, another data for the World Trade Economic mentioned that uh, if you can make the, the shipments faster, uh, the supply chain faster, you can grow the trades uh, around the world in 15%. So imagine, grow 15% using a solution that could be decentralized. Yeah, fair use. Um, we'll finish, I see, with, with um, Norbert. Your thoughts on that and how decentralizations affect, well, actually, funny enough, Trust, which is the name of your company. I think that future is semi-centralized. Uh, in uh, in trust, we are we are building our solution uh, on Stellar, and we are becoming an anchor in Stellar, and we can issue uh, as many tokens as we want, the unique tokens. So we are helping uh, entrepreneurs to bring blockchain into their applications, and when they 
issue tokens uh, that are usable in their applications, they, those tokens uh, become tradable on decentralized Stellar Exchange instantly. So they are semi-decentralized uh, application because we are semi-centralized and these uh, applications owners are also centralized, but their to tokens are completely de decentralized because we can freely trade them on a global scale. So I think the future is semi-centralized. Yeah, I actually think that we'll see more and more applications of blockchain and decentralized economy with the development of IoT when, when we come to kind of a robot economy, if you like, where the robots interact which is, which, with each other without even, even the, any human or centralized uh, influence on that. So think about like fully automated logistics center, for example, fully automated transport and, and stuff like that. Yeah, I think that's spot on. And it's interesting to see that you all seem to ag agree on this sort of hybrid approach, yeah. uh, which seems to be pragmatic. Um, fair use. So I guess well, we have time for some questions in the audience. I'm trying to locate someone who could help with a microphone. If you could raise your hand, maybe there, Lou and Alex. All right, brilliant. So we have Alex over there, Lou over here. Questions. There's one over here in the front. Let's start with a gentleman. And we'll go to you, sir. Maybe number two. Who's number three? There's no number three. We'll start with number one. Hi there. Uh, Stephen from Lawyers of Tomorrow here. Um, the question is about going back to security. Isn't really the issue when it comes to security that we talk about well, how secure are things compared to what we have now? So if you take uh, finance and so forth, what we do is when I buy something from Amazon, I basically give them my credit card and my private keys and I let them hold on to it. Whereas once we get into a cryptographic world, only I will have my keys and only the person I send the message to is going to get access to that. So I think isn't the question that security in the future is going to be much more, uh, much more effective than it is now with current finance? All right, who wants to pick that up on security? Yeah, so you had. I, th I think, you know, to answer that, yeah, you know, you make a good point. You know, people, uh, probably one of them, naively so for years, you know, happy to, to jump onto Amazon Prime or any other merchant store and give away my, my credit card, debit card details. And you know, if you actually look behind the scene, the bottleneck or, or honeypot of data which they store on us is, is pretty scary if you actually lift the hood and look under that. And we don't do that. Now, yes, you know, the advent of uh, blockchain technology and cryptocurrencies in terms of from a transactional standpoint, either from the order processing and the, the collection of fiat and settlement of the goods, all of that, you know, from the kind of I place my order, it goes on a blockchain. I send my, my funds, which not only triggers a smart contract, which then kicks out my order, which then I receive. You know, so it's kind of this immutable end-to-end -end process, which is fantastic. That's great, but it does create new vectors of attack. There's stuff that you know, we've got to forward think that, you know, find, as I said, you know, phishing attacks on wallet addresses and 51% uh, compromisations and other things. So um, on one hand, yes, you have this tick box of it is more secure, 